salvation for him. I don't want to stay in the spiritual condition that I'm in. I don't want to stay in the physical condition that I'm in. When I serve a God that's a miracle worker, he's a way maker, he parts the Red Sea, he's a miracle mover. Nothing is impossible for our God. But we gotta believe. We have to believe and we have to go after him. And so this weekend when we worship, give it your all. Forget about the person on your left. Forget about the person on your right. Tell the person on your left, give me some space today. Give me some space today. Because I'm going to worship my Jesus. I'm going to go after my Jesus. I, I'm going to go after my miracle. I'm going to go after my suddenly. Let's sing it one more time. I'm a spirit shift now. Chains be broken. these pastors we have, uh, Pastor Mona and Pastor Matthew. Let's give a hand. And their church is an example of a worshiping church. Yes. From the front to the back. You don't know who's leading, the congregation or the worship leader. <laughs> Literally. Worshiping church and a praying church. And so you're going to be blessed this weekend, but I want you to open your heart to whatever God wants to do. And I'd like to call my husband up, Pastor Al. Yay. Who just wrote a book. And he's so handsome. He's looking so good today. <laughs> I want everybody to give Jesus the biggest praise you can. Come on, somebody, shout. One more shout to the Lord. Shout to the Lord with a voice of triumph. Hey. Praise the Lord. Amen. Look at your neighbor today and tell them, I'm glad I sat next to you. Tell them, you look good. You smell good. God is good. Amen. And uh, this morning, I want you to take hold of your Bibles this morning. And this is Atmosphere Shift Weekend. And as you turn with me to the book of First Chronicles, 
I want to welcome everybody that came in. We have people that have come in for the weekend from Los Angeles area. I look over to my left and I see my beautiful, beautiful mom. And I have to preach and now I'm nervous. I tell people all the time, I prayed my mom into the kingdom, but ever since she got saved, she's been praying for me. How many are grateful for praying mothers? Praying mothers. And I'll tell you, she's prayed me out of some doozies. Spiritual attack and the enemy coming against. And uh, thank you, Mama. Love you. Also, I'm so blessed to see all the pastors that have come. Pastor Carlos. We love Pastor Carlos. We love Victor Archivista. Um, also, it's good to have uh, Pastor Martini Nance. You know, I advise you guys something. Carlos and Martini. Just take tomorrow off. Come to church here. Amen. Give yourselves a retreat. Let your second or your third man preach. Because God's going to be moving in this place all weekend. How many can say amen? Don't worry about the offering. It'll be all right. Amen. And it's so great to have you guys. And also, I'm so blessed also to have a good, good friend of mine who, he's a brother in the Lord, man. I love him with all my heart. He is a soldier, literally a soldier for our city. And Captain Ernesto Servine is here today. We love you, man. Huh? I mean, Lieutenant, excuse me, Lieutenant Servine. Well, maybe I'm prophesying to you. The Bible says, speak those things that are not as if though they were. So you never know what God is doing. And he has some of the other brothers here with him today. I call you brothers. You're brothers today. I know you're officers. And, but in the house of God, you're brothers. Amen. Brothers in Christ. And we pray for them. And also, I'm so grateful to have with us, and you'll be hearing more from him in a minute, Pastor Matthew Thompson and Pastor Mona Thompson from... Boston, Massachusetts. And I won't even get into it, man. I took him to the Laker game yesterday. I tried to convert him. Let's just say that spirit only comes out through prayer and fasting. <laughs> Some spirits, man, you got to fast for 40 days and 40 nights. But we love them very much. You'll be hearing from them later. First Chronicles chapter 12. And I want to just share a quick word. I'm not going to be speaking very long today. And we're going to begin reading in verse 23. When you have it, say, I got it. It reads like this. It says, now there were the numbers of the divisions that were equipped for war. And it came to David at Hebron to turn over the kingdom of Saul to him, according to the word of the Lord. Of the sons of Judah bearing shield and spear, 6,800 armed for war. Of the sons of Simeon, mighty men of valor, fit for war, 7,100. Of the sons of Levi, 4,600. Jehudea, the leader of the Aaronites, and with him 3,700. Zadok, a young man, a valiant warrior from his father's house, 22 captains. Of the sons of Benjamin, relatives of Saul, 3,000, until the greatest part of them had remained loyal to the house of Saul. Of the sons of Ephraim, 20,800 mighty men of valor, famous men. Someone say famous men. Someone say famous women. Throughout their father's house of the half-tribe of Manasseh, 18,000, who were designed by name to come and make David king. Of the sons of Issachar, who had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do. Their chiefs were 200, and all their brethren were at their command. Of Zebulun, 5,000 who went out to battle, experts in war, with all the weapons of war. Stout-hearted men. We got any stout-hearted men here today who could keep ranks. Of Natali, 1,000 captains, with them 37,000 with shield and spear. Of the Danites, who could keep battle formation, 28,600. Of Asher, those who could go out to war. Notice the word. Repeated <clears throat> war, war, able to keep battle formation. 4,000 of the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half tribe of Manasseh from the other side of the Jordan, 120,000 armed for battle with every kind of weapon of war. And all these men of war who could keep rank came to he 
Hebron with a loyal heart to make David king over all Israel. And all the rest of Israel were of one mind to make David king. This morning, as we begin our atmosphere shift weekend, I want to talk to you about shifting the kingdom. Shifting the kingdom. Before you see it, look at your neighbor and tell them, it is time to shift. You may be seated. I also want to welcome those who are watching us online this morning who might not have been able to make it. I want everyone to say this with me. Say shift. When we come to this portion, we find that David is at a very pivotal and key moment in his life when the armies of Israel have it in mind to transition the kingdom of Saul into his hands. The time for David had come to become king. He spent his time in the shepherd's field. He had spent his time in the cave of Adram. And he'd proven his leadership. How many know there comes a time in every believer's life where we prove our leadership? And he had proven his leadership. He'd proven himself through many battles and became known as a man after God's own heart. So now it's time for him to take his place. I believe that as we talk about shifting the kingdom, this is the time for you to take your place. I want you to look at your neighbor neighbor and tell them, you need to take your place. And how many know when we take our place, we take our place through prayer. It's time for David to take his place. And what's significant to me is that It lists the names of people who assisted him in shifting the kingdom into his hands. Listen to me when I tell you that it requires an army. Somebody say army. Somebody say we are an army. It requires an army to shift the kingdom. It requires an army who can walk in rank an army that is loyal and an army with a heart after God to shift the kingdom. Touch your neighbor this morning, tell him it's time to shift. And you'll you'll take notice here that there were many men of war from the various tribes, warriors by the hundreds and by the thousands. In fact, I totaled them up. There were a total of 326,023 men of war who can fight in battle and keep rank in the army. True-hearted warriors who understood battle. And what we find, if you study these men who are helping David to shift the kingdom, they were experienced in tribal warfare. They were experienced because they knew what it was to protect their tribe. That when the enemy came against their tribe, or the enemy came against their family, or the enemy came against their fields, that they were sowing seed, They knew how to draw the sword, how to draw the spear, how to pick up the shield and protect what they were building for the glory of God. Come on, somebody. And I wonder if this morning there's anyone here that you've been building for God. God bless half of you. Or there's anyone here that you've been building for God. So my question this morning is, have you developed the ability to wage spiritual warfare against the enemy, to take back what the devil has stolen? I came to tell you, we have the power and the anointing of God to protect the house, protect the field, protect the family. These men, the Bible records them as famous warriors. Somebody say famous warriors. When I think about the ministry of Victor Outreach International, I mentioned people like Pastor Ed Morales. I mentioned people like Pastor Steve Pineda. I mentioned people like our very own founder, Pastor Sonny Argonzoni. And when you think of those names, you think of famous warriors. Men who have fought the battle. Men who know how to pray. Men who know how to fast. Men who know how to do spiritual warfare. And I'm grateful that because they learned how to fight, we have an inheritance for the glory of God. Famous warriors who became famous through valiant battles. They learned to be victorious in the name of the Lord. And because they tasted the Lord's victory in their life, they became well-known in the land, well-known in the battle. I'm, I'm praying and believing God 
that here at Victory Outreach San Diego, not only our church, but in our region, there will be leaders who become famous in that. Famous in battle. Now, these men came to David with three things. Number one, they came with the loyalty of heart. Number two, they came with the ability to keep rank. Let me put it this way. When you're doing warfare and you're shifting, you can't have an independent spirit. The enemy's too strong. The Bible says two are better than one. Touch your neighbor and tell them two are better than one. The Bible says a threefold cord is not easily broken. So we're strong with two, but we're unstoppable with three. Come on, somebody. Tell your neighbor, partner with me. They had the ability to keep rank. And number three, they had the oneness of mind. All of these things are important qualities to establish the kingdom of God wherever we go. Now, in the midst of this massive list of warriors, there were 326,023 just men. I, I think if you count the women, it was probably a, a million. Yeah. Because women outnumber men. Come on, somebody. And if you're single and a man of God and you can't get married, you must be ugly. Can I hear an amen? <laughs> got to keep it real. Got to hear it. Amen. But women are warriors, too. That's it. That's all I get. I said women are warriors, too. In the massive list of warriors, there's one group of people that stands out among this massive list. And we cannot overlook them. Because if they were not important, they would not be listed. But because they are listed, we must examine them. It's found in verse 32 of 1 Chronicles chapter 12. And it says, and the sons of Issachar, who had understanding of the times, to know what Israel ought to do. The sons of Issachar, who had understanding of the times. The sons of Issachar stand out to me because they were not ordinary warriors. Where the other warriors carried weapons, the sons of Issachar had spiritual weapons. Where the other warriors fought with shield and spear and sword and bow, the sons of Issachar fought with prayer. They fought with prophecy. They fought in the spirit. How many know the Lord has given us the power to defeat the enemy in the spirit realm, to break down strongholds, to cast down imaginations. How many can say amen? amen? And these sons of Issachar, they were not ordinary men. The Bible tells us if you study them, they were men of insight, men of accurate calculation. They were spiritual leaders. They possessed spiritual sharpness, keenness of thought, vision, and hearing. They were leaders who were accurate calculators of the times. And I feel this is so important and so strategic to our church and to our leadership because we're living in a day where we, we, we need to raise up people who know how to pray, people that know how to intercede, people that are in tune with the spirits, people who are accurate calculators of the times. The Bible tells us, if you study, is that they were experts in spiritual matters. They studied the stars. They developed the Jewish calendar. They were able to align the people of God with God's plan. Look at your neighbor today and tell him God has a plan for you. But I have learned in serving God for 25 years that the only way to discover his plan is you must have a prayer life. You must have an altar. You must have a place of separation. You must have a prayer closet. You must know how to get a hold of God and get a hold of the horns of the altar. And when you begin to bow your knee in prayer, that's when God begins to reveal his plan. That's when God begins to give you a vision. That's when God begins to show you what Israel ought to do. We're dealing with a new generation that seems so confused. With the advent of social media and all these distractions. I, I, I believe that this weekend, it's time to declare war on your distractions. 
It's time to declare war on the things that are distracting you because whatever can distract you can defeat you. Whatever can distract you can isolate you. Whatever can distract you can pull you out of the house of God. Whatever can distract you can pull you out of your prayer closet. Ever notice that you wanted to pray, but as soon as you picked up your phone, you lost that feeling? You've got to declare war on your distractions this weekend and declare to the enemy, enough is enough. I'm ready to seek the face of God. I'm ready to hear the voice of God. Yeah. Tell your neighbor, declare war. These were men and women, I believe, who were experts in culture timing and strategy. They had spiritual insight. My prayer is that not only would God raise up famous warriors in our midst, but my prayer is that God would raise up leaders with spiritual insight. Where the sons of Issachar knew what Israel ought to do, that God would raise up leaders in our ministry with spiritual insight. In, 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 in Daniel chapter 2, it says, in, in verse 21, it says, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and, and might are his. And he changes the times and seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. Look at this. He reveals deep and secret things. Deep and secret things. When you spend time with God, when you spend time in prayer, God will reveal to you deep and secret things, things that others know not of. Can I hear an amen? It's kingdom secrets. The Bible says Abraham heard from the Lord regarding the condition of Sodom and Gomorrah, that the Lord was going to destroy that city, but the Lord showed it to Abraham first before he did it. Why does God show you things before he does things? Because God says you have the power to pray. You have the power to shift. You have the power to make a difference in your prayer. Come on, somebody. God doesn't show it to us so we could be smarter than everybody. God shows it to us because we have power. We have the anointing. We have the prayer life. We have the spirit to be able to change that situation. I don't know what God has been showing you about your family. I don't know what God has been showing you about your marriage. I don't know what God has been showing you about your finances, but I came to tell you he's showing you because he's giving you the power in prayer to shift that situation. Oh, my God. Insight. We've got to change the way we fight. And I'm almost done preaching. We've got to change the way we fight. Look at your neighbor and tell them, you've got to change the way you fight. You've got to change the way you do battle. See, King David understood the, 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 the importance of spiritual insight in battle. We know he was defeated by the Philistine, by, by actually by uh, the Amalekites, I believe. And the Bible says that the, the, the defeat was so treacherous that even his own mighty men of valor turned on him. And they wanted to kill him. Listen, leader, there are going to be times where your people turn on you. No matter how many victories you've shown them, no matter how many times you've broken them through, no matter how many times you've served them, but when your people turn on you, you've got to learn to inquire of the Lord. And the Bible says David took the linen ephod and he began to encourage himself and he began to inquire of the Lord. Listen, understand me when I tell you it was in David's nature to fight. He killed the lion. He killed the bear. He killed the Philistine. He cut his head off. David was a, a warrior. He knew how to sling him. Can I get VO on you in a minute? He knew how to take it to the chest. He never backed down from anybody. He was not afraid to shed a little bit of blood. But understand me, even though he fought in the natural, he also knew how to fight in the spiritual. David could have took it on himself just to go to battle. I mean, it's like throwing a fish in the water. The fish already knows how to swim. You don't got to teach it. It's second nature. For David to be in a fight, it was second nature. But the Bible says he, in that situation, he had to change the way he fought. I want to tell you here right now, Victor Outreach San Diego, Victor Outreach San Diego County, in this new season, we've got to change the way we fight. 
We've got to begin to inquire of the Lord. Why? Because we lose so many people in our churches because they only know how to fight one way. Sometimes our people fail in battle because they're fighting the wrong battle. Woo. They're fighting their brothers and sisters. They're fighting their pastors. They're fighting their leaders. They're fighting the church itself. They're, they're, they're fighting everything. They're fighting the wrong battle. Ask your neighbor, are you fighting the right battle? And because they fight the wrong battle, watch this, they deplete themselves of valuable resources. Valuable resources required for the right battle. Resources you need when the real battles come. They deplete themselves. Why? Because they fight wars that God never intended them to fight. And they get into scuffles that the Lord says, I'm not even in that thing. Come on, somebody. Am I talking truth in this place? They argue with people that they shouldn't be arguing with. They complain about things they shouldn't be complaining about. But David inquired of the Lord. David sought the Lord, even in his worst time of defeat. And what did the Lord say? The Lord said to him, pursue. Pursue the enemy. And when the Lord tells you to pursue, that means the Lord's giving you the victory. That means God has given you the territory you seek to take possession of. Because you're moving with the favor of God. You're moving with the approval of God. My, my third prayer is that we would raise up leaders that are moving in the approval of God. I feel like so many times we seek the approval of man. And man will let you down every time. But how many know when you seek the approval of God and God gives you the green light, and the Lord says, pursue and take back what the devil has stolen. I came to tell you, you cannot be defeated. We've got to change the way we fight. I believe that many times we know how to fight with this. This is a real sword. Don't mess with me. with you. This is a real sword. Man, you know how to fight. <laughs> you know how to swing that sword. You know how to, you know, stick and move. And we know how to do all these things in the natural. But I came to tell you, God is changing the weapons you use. I believe that in this season of shifting, God is shifting your tools. He's shifting your weapons. He's, ship, he's shifting your methods. He's shifting the way you do warfare. God is saying in this season to put the sword down and to pick up. You can give me that here today. Put the sword down and pick up the shovel. Come on, who knows where I'm going with this? Come on, who knows where I'm going with this? In 2 Kings chapter 3, Israel and Judah teamed up to fight against the Moabites who were coming against them. And they came to a valley that was dry. They came to a place of drought where they ran out of water. And their cattle could not drink and their animals could not drink. And they said, is there a man that we can inquire of the Lord about? Come on, somebody. He said, there's a prophet named Elijah who used to pour water on the hands of Elijah. And he came to him and he says, what do you want me to do? He says, we're going to lose in this battle unless you tell us what to do, son of Issachar. Come on, somebody. We're going to lose in battle unless the prophet of God tells us what to do. And he says, listen, there's not going to be any rain and there's not going to be any wind. But if you'll pick up a shovel and you'll go down into the valley and you'll dig some trenches. Come on, somebody, if you'll take a shovel, put the sword down for a minute, take the shovel, go down into the valley and start digging a little bit. What is God saying to this generation? What is God saying to you this morning? Take that shovel, dig a trench of prayer, begin to fast, start putting in some spiritual work. And the prophet said, if you'll dig a trench, God will fill it with water. God will fill it with a fresh anointing. God will fill it with fresh power. Is there anyone here that this weekend you came to the house of God because you want to start? digging again.
again. You want to start working in prayer again. You want to start pushing the enemy. I came to tell you. I came to tell you that if you'll put down the sword, tell your neighbor, put down the sword and pick up the shovel. You might have to go to the shed because you haven't used the shovel in a mighty long time. You might have to go to your neighbor's house because the last time you saw them, you let them borrow your shovel. And you need to go to your neighbor and say, give me my shovel back because I'm going into a season of prayer. I'm going into a season of fast. I'm about to shift my season. Oh, I wish I had a church that was ready to shift. I wish I had a people that said, I'm ready to pray. I'm ready to fast. Touch your neighbor and tell them it's time to dig. It's time to dig. Come on, say, it's time to dig. I know you're tired. I know you're weak. I know you're weary. But if you'll dig, God will fill those trenches with fresh water. If you'll dig, God will give you the breakthrough. If you dig, God will shift your season. If you dig, God will perform a miracle. Put down the sword and pick up the shovel and start digging. Start praying. Start fasting. Oh, somebody praise him in this place. Somebody praise him right now. Sometimes God will ask you to do things that don't make sense. It would have been easy to just send rain. It would have been easy just to send a storm. But I love the attitude of the prophet because the prophet Elisha had an attitude. <laughs> Don't get mad at the preachers that have attitudes. Don't get mad at the men and women of God that have attitudes, man. If you knew what we had to deal with, you would understand why we have an attitude sometimes. <laughs> He looked at the king of Israel. He said, hey, listen, here, joker, I'm not even going to talk to you. In fact, read the scripture. He said, I'm not even going to see you. Go worship those other gods like you've been doing. But Jehoshaphat, I'll talk to him because he has a little bit of fear of God. And because he has a little bit of fear of God, I can work a miracle with somebody that has a little bit of fear of God. Come on, somebody, clap as this gets inside of you. And he got an attitude. He got an attitude. Someone say attitude. Didn't one guy once say, your attitude will shift, will, will determine your altitude? So this prophet cops an attitude, and he says, I'm not going to send no rain. I know you think rain, you know, rain's the answer. And I'm not going to send no wind, and I'm not going to send a storm. What I want you to do I want you to put in some work. See, my feelings don't determine my worship. My worship determines my feelings. And sometimes you got to work. And that prophet looked at them and he says, you're going to have to dig. In other words, what I believe this prophet was saying, a little bit softer, is he was saying this, how bad do you want it? How bad do you want it? And not only how bad do you want it, how much of it do you want? <laughs> because if you want fresh water, you're gonna have to learn how to work with a shovel. And you're going to have to take yourself down into that valley. And you're going to have to put some elbow grease. You're going to have to activate some dead things. You're going to have to bring some things that were dead and bring them back to life so that God can do the miracle that he wants to do. How bad do you want it? Victory Outreach, I got a question. How bad do you want revival? How bad do you want fresh water? How bad do you want a fresh anointing? How bad do you want it? Or did you just come here to spectate? Are you a worshiper or a watcher? Did you come to be entertained spiritually? Or did you come with a need in your life? And God is saying to you, if you're going to get that breakthrough, you got to pick up that shovel. You got to work your ground. He who works his ground will have an abundance of food. How bad, how bad do you want?
want it. And then how much of it do you want? See, sometimes you got to wrestle. Sometimes you got to dig. And, and then sometimes you got to get some pots. No, not that pot. See, I'm trying to get you out of that pot. Get another pot. Tell your neighbor, get some pots. There was a woman that only had a little bit of oil. A little bit of oil. And the prophet told her, listen, you're not going to die. Your season's about to shift, but I'm going to need you to dig. So he tells the woman, go to your neighbor's house and start knocking on the doors and ask people for pots, for vessels. And the Bible says she did what the prophet said. The Bible says, obey the prophets and you shall be blessed. She did what the prophet said. She goes door to door. Do you have a pot? I only got a little pot. That's okay. Do you got a pot? I only got a big one. That's okay. Hey, do you got a pot? And she went door by door by door by door. See, how bad do you want it? It's so hard just to get people to the house of God. But how bad do you want it? And she went door to door, door to door, door to door. And then the Bible says she got a lot of pots and she went home. And then she went into her room and closed the door, representing her prayer closet. And she took that little bit of oil and she began to pour it in the pot. And the Bible says as she poured it in the pot, it filled to the top. And then she got another pot and she filled that one and it filled to the top. And then she filled the next one to the top. And then she filled the next one to the top. And she just kept on filling it until all the pots were full. And then the Bible says that when she ran out of pots, the anointing stopped flowing. How bad do you want it? And how much of it do you want? I've discovered that I can have as much of God as I want. I can have as much of God as I make room for. I can have as much of the anointing, but I've got to create some space in my life. Is there anyone here right now, you say, this weekend, Pastor, I brought a shovel to church. This weekend, Pastor, I put my sword down and I brought a shovel. If you brought a shovel, I want you to start praising him. I want you to start thanking him. I want you to start worshiping him. Come on, Marky, let's sing it. Everybody, come on, everybody, start digging. Fill me up hey. till I overflow. 